It is what we call Sabbath Sunday. And some people might be hearing that and thinking, like, isn't, isn't every Sunday Sabbath Sunday? Because if you grew up like I did, you had a very, very clear view of what Sabbath was. It was the Lord's Day. It was Sunday. And there were certain things that you did and certain things you did not do on the Sabbath. But what we traditionally think of or understand as Sabbath is really in Scripture not the same thing. And so first, maybe let me kind of correct or calibrate or adjust this, this idea, this concept. You know, in the, in the Jewish tradition, this idea of Sabbath was, number one, it was not on Sunday. It was from, from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And it was this day carved out to practice a rhythm of rest, A rhythm of rest that was introduced to us by God in creation when on the seventh day he rested. And now I've always looked at that as as God is God. He didn't rest because all of a sudden after creating everything, God was like, whew, I'm exhausted. That's not what it was about. It was our creator modeling something for his creation that he knew we would need in order to sustain the responsibilities and demands of life. And so he modeled, modeled a rhythm of rest uh, once every seven days. And that's not a practice that I'm really good at. There are some people on our team that are a little bit better at it than others. But we decided that just as your body needs a rhythm of rest, your physical body has to have moments where you pause, where you settle, where you just cease for a little while. The church is a body. And so we practice a rhythm of rest to rest the body in so many ways. So twice a year, we just decide we're not gonna have in-person gatherings. It usually falls toward the end of December, toward the end of the year, and somewhere in the middle of the year, typically around the July 4th week when we know that we have a ton of people that get a chance to not have to go to work for at least a few days. And so we just hit pause and and we rest. Now, one of the things I don't want you to say is, well, my church is not having church on Sunday. First of all, church is not something that you that you have or don't have because church is not an event. It's not a building It's not a building, it's a body. It's not a place, it's a people. And so we're just not gathering today in the same place, the same physical location, but we are still the church. And I hope if you've learned anything, especially from the series that we've been in in recent weeks, is that we're shifting our idea of what we think about when we hear the word church that it's not just about what happens in this room on Sundays. It's not confined to a specific set of traditional ideas. In this series that we've been calling This Is Vintage, we've been talking about the culture of our church. And in the culture of our church, I want to set a new idea in all of our minds about what's triggered in us when we hear the word church that when you hear the word church, you don't think of a specific building with ornate fixtures and stained glass and steeples and pews, or you don't even think about a certain style of music or anything like that, but you think about the body of Christ living and breathing the mission of Jesus in the place and time in which we've been put to accomplish things for his glory. And today is about looking at all those people that serve and sacrifice so much and saying in a really maybe small but super tangible way, thank you for what you do. Thank you for what you do. See, I don't don't know if you know this. I know some people know this quite well, that for this church to do all the things that it is called to do, to serve our community and to advance the gospel, it takes many, many hands there are dozens and dozens of people that serve our church sacrificially and selflessly. They give of their time, they get up. And I'm not just talking about on Sundays. Yes, on Sundays, there are people here 
before the sun rises and they're here for hours doing really thankless, invisible jobs as well as ones that you can see quite clearly. And I'm so humbled by the number of people that have said yes over the last 17 years. It's hard to believe it's been 17 years. Matter of fact, at the time of this recording, we're within about a week of literally the day that Ashley and I moved up to North Carolina to start this journey of Vintage Church. It was, I'm pretty sure it was June 25th. It was a Monday, June 25th of 2007. And what we have seen over these years, this is vintage, has this church has been made possible because of so many people. When we moved up here on that, on that Monday, we had a lot of dreams, but no money. We had a ton of hopes, but really zero people. And so what we did over the last several years, over the last over the first several days and years of this church was get an opportunity to share with people what we've been sharing with you. See, I knew from the beginning what God was calling us to do was so much, so much bigger than I or my wife or any small group of people could do that we would need people that would understand what God was putting in our hearts. And I'll never forget we would get a chance to have conversations with people and I would get this question, well, what kind of church are you planning? And it's interesting how you answer questions is so dependent on what you think they mean by the question when they ask it. And I don't know that I ever answered that question in the way that people were looking for. I think more often than not, when people say, well, what kind of church Are you planting? They were thinking, is this a Baptist church? Is this a Methodist church? Like what kind of church? Meaning what denominational connection did you have? And that's never been something that we've tried to get tethered to or wrapped in because our goal has always been to be a biblical church more than any specific denominational church. But how I would answer that question would be by unpacking the things that we've been talking about for the last nine weeks. I started talking about the kind of culture that I wanted to see us create in this body that would be known as Vintage Church. Believing that as we opened up the book of Acts and walked through those first days and years of the movement that Jesus launched, it was not marked by some elaborate strategy. It was identified by this really intentional, beautiful culture. And Over the last 17 years, I've tried to protect that culture. There has been so much that has changed, even as I'm I'm sitting in this room and I'm looking about how much this room has even changed since we moved into this building in 2018. There has been so much that has changed, but there have been a few things, a few important things that have not changed at all. I've submitted to you throughout this series that if we don't have a culture that aligns with scripture, we will not make disciples that look like Jesus. And in order to protect that culture, we established four core values that would serve as as the protectors, the guardrails, the, the boundaries to make sure that we stayed within the center of the culture that we believed honored God, made disciples, and actually put a dent in what God wanted to do in a community for his kingdom. And these core values are things that we've just kind of dug out of the culture that we see in the book of Acts and all throughout all the scriptures. And let me remind you of these things that steer us as a church. We value intentional relationships because we believe God does from the onset of everything in scripture, we see the importance of intentional relationships. We value inspirational leadership because we believe that all throughout the Bible, you see God raise up men and women to lead alongside of one another in God's church and for his glory. We we value innovative environments because we are always gonna see the importance of making the pivot when something doesn't work or it's ineffective or it's inefficient and making sure that we are doing things in a way that adjust our approach, that we change our methodology, 
while protecting our theology to make sure that we reach people where they are and help them to understand the truth of the gospel. And we value an integrated community. And in so many ways, we see that play out just as in last weekend, as we were at the church of Ashboro, that we are integrated into the community of believers that are beyond the four walls of this church and throughout our community. And this church exists because over the last 17 years, people have said, that's the kind of culture that I wanna be a part of. That's the kind of culture that I wanna help create. And the culture that's created in our church is a collective effort so many people just saying yes. And believe it or not, I've been sharing those core values for almost 17 years. It wasn't always from a platform to 12 or 1300 people. It started off y'all in in coffee shops or in uh, restaurants where I had a three ring binder that I would carry in to Uh, lunch meetings and dinner meetings and cups of coffee and I would lay the three ring binder on the table and I would open it up and I would just flip through. Uh, This is our core value, intentional relationships. And I would unpack these things maybe to a couple or to an individual or to a family and people would say yes. And what I discovered is there were people that were looking for something different. People that understood that what they were being called to was to be a a part of something that they would contribute to. They They were looking for something to be a part of that was bigger than themselves. And our church is what it is. This is vintage because of so many that have said, those won't be just the things that an organization values. Those will be the things that individually they would adopt as their own values for how they would live out the individual call to serve Jesus and build his kingdom. You know, there's a word that's often associated with church that has always puzzled me, membership. From the onset of our church and the culture that I knew we needed to create to protect and live out those values, I felt like we needed to abandon that word. I don't know, again, just like when I say church, there's certain things that come to mind. There's just words that we use because of our experience. It it triggers ideas and thoughts. And for me, membership, I always think uh, country club. That you pay your dues and as a member, you are given certain rights. And so often we see that ruin a church culture, when it becomes more about what we want to be entitled to instead of who we are responsible for. And in order to flip that dynamic and and change that idea that the church is not a place where we should be consumed with what we have the right to, it should be a place where we understand what we are responsible and who we are responsible for. It is not a place to consume. It is a place to contribute. It is a place not to just serve, but to be served. It's both. It's, it's, It's this dynamic body of believers where we use what God has put in us to help help that church accomplish accomplish its mission. And so from the onset of our church, we have used this word partnership. And today I'm grateful that we get a chance to offer a Sabbath to those people that have said yes to partnership, those people that have agreed to contribute and to serve and to sacrifice and to give so much of who they are in order for our church to do all the amazing things that is done. Now, no question that what we've seen in the last 17 years is all glory and credit to God, but he has worked within the obedience and selflessness of people like you. And today, really what I wanna do is just say, say thank you. I wish I knew how to appropriately express my gratitude to all the people. There even the people that are in this building right now. We're recording this on a weeknight when people could be with their families and some came straight from work and 
That has been the story of our church. And every chapter of it, it includes people making sacrifices so that we could advance the gospel and serve and love on people, whether it be Sunday mornings or sitting here for hours with a couple that's battling to save their marriage or spending a week in a cabin with smelly middle schoolers to ensure that they understand the importance of knowing and following Jesus. And in searching for words to express my gratitude, God brought me to two passages of scripture that I just wanna quickly invite you to look at with me. The first one is in Philippians. So if you got a Bible, would you go to Philippians with me? Go to Philippians chapter one. Paul was a church planner. He went from community to community to share Jesus and then he would move on from that community and he would have to entrust what was began in and through him and other people to people who were willing to say, we got this. We're not just gonna sit back and watch. We're gonna participate because they knew that church wasn't a spectator place. It was a participator place. It was a place where people were supposed to get involved. And when Paul writes to these churches, yeah, so often we think about Paul's letters of being full of his correction, but so often you also see them full of his affection for people that worked alongside him for the mission of the gospel and the glory of God. And what he says to them and about them is what I feel like I can say to and about you, our church family. It's Philippians chapter one, starting with verse three. Paul says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Verse five, because of your partnership, in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, that he who has started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and in every kind of discernment so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of our God. It's those verses that brought this word partnership to the surface of my heart and became embedded in the culture of our church. That when Paul reflects on his experience with the people at Philippi, he he refers to them with that with that word, with that language. He says because of your partnership in the gospel. Thank you for your partnership in the gospel. Thank you for partnering, not just with me, but with this body. Thank you for partnering in serving our kids, cleaning our parking lot, using your gifts. Thank you for all the ways that you partner in helping us inspire people to live and love like Jesus. You are vintage. It's never been about a single person or a single event or a single day. It's been about people understanding that the call to make disciples, the call to grow God's kingdom, the, the call to make the gospel of Jesus Christ known throughout our community and across the world is the responsibility of us all. And when we all shoulder the burden of the mission, we do it with effectiveness and power and beauty. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I dreamed of, I prayed for, 
people to partner with me in this thing that God had put on my heart. And there were seasons where I wondered if anybody would get it, if anybody would be able to relate, if anybody would understand. And it seems like over and over again, God continues just to blow my mind with the number of people that catch it, believe it, own it. When I read these verses years ago, I remember praying for partners and I'm still praying for partners because I deeply believe there's so much more work to be done. And maybe there's some people watching this that for some reason you've yet to step into that level of commitment and connection and partner. And maybe there's good reasons for that hesitation, but maybe there's things that God is shedding even as I'm speaking and God's pressing on you to know, to, to do more to do more than just sit in this room, to do more than just show up on Sundays, to do more than just consume, but to contribute. But I return to that verse, verse six, where Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I think we've started, but we're far from completed all that God wants to do in and through our church. I think there's still families that need to be healed. There's still souls that need to be found. There's still people who are lost and hurting and broken and they need the message of Jesus Christ. And God's called us to take that message into every corner of the world and every place in this community where God has given us a platform. So let's keep going. Father, thank you so much for every single life, every single person, every single sacrifice that's been made over these years to create this church. Father, I pray that Today is a day where people feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude from the leadership of this place and an appreciation for what we all get to do together, God. I pray that you would continue to give us wisdom so that we can be healthy people who help people, who practice that rhythm of rest not just collectively, but individually, so that we can walk with passion and obedience in the calling you've put on all of our lives, a calling to make you known to the world, a calling to inspire people to live and love like Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.